Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So today we're going to light the candle of faith. And faith means trusting in God. And that sounds easier than it sometimes is. Having faith can be difficult, especially because we can't see God. But on the first Christmas, God sent his son Jesus into the world as a human, just like us. So people could see him, touch him, he could touch them. We need to remember that all our faith starts there. That Jesus came for us. That's what we base our faith on. We did nothing to deserve this privilege, but he gave it to us anyway. When we have faith and we trust him. And in commotion, we sing a song, and it fits right in with this. One verse says, he saved us, and it's not because of what we've done. He saved us when the love of God came through his son. He saved us, and it's no reward for what we give. He saved us, and because of his mercy, we live. As we look at these candles and the light they give, let's thank God for the gift of faith and his son Jesus, who is the light of the world. Pray. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of love to us in Jesus Christ. We know Jesus is our Savior, but we have faith in him. May we all know in our hearts the love of God found through faith this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, amen. And if there are any children here who weren't brave enough to come up and who don't come to promotion, we gave the children at promotion a gift. It's called Look to the Light, and it's an Advent book about um, the light of the world. And there are 3D glasses in it. So if you want one, see me. All right. All right, when you get a new pastor, you always expect a few changes. Uh, so one of the things I asked him to do is put the numbers of the hymns in the bulletin. I like using the hymnal myself. Where did I just put it? Oh, yeah, right here in front of me. <laughs> if you'd like to use the hymnal, you're welcome to use the hymnal. And as far as I know, it'll still be up there. So if you'd like, turn to 193 in the hymnal or just stand with me as we sing It Came Upon a Midnight Clear.
us to go before the throne of grace this morning. Father, we just come before you at this time and just come to be still before you and know that you are God. We thank you that we can gather this Lord's Day weather didn't hinder us, but you brought such beauty to our surroundings. We thank you for the coming of the Christ child that we remember this season every year, <coughs> that you have reached out to humanity knowing our desperate need of a Savior. We pray your blessing upon the season. We pray your blessing upon those who choose to come into the house of God to hear the Christmas message told again. May it bring joy to the hearts of all who hear. May it bring your peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray today for those who are in nursing homes and those who are just feel they can't come out in this kind of weather and be here and uh, we ask that you would just be with them and bless them. As we go this afternoon up to the nursing home, may we bring courage and your love to people who are shut in. We think this morning of those who are not well and I see names in the bulletin that I don't know them and I don't know what their story is, but each of them needs your hand of grace. I think today also of Randy Smith who lost his license and how discouraging that must be and how difficult that will make his life, no, deep, uh, no doubt. Lord, we always want to pray for healing, but that is not always your divine will and sovereign will. And we pray your grace would sustain each person accordingly. We think of the Kenny family this morning as the missionaries of the month, I see. Uh, wonderful family serving you in Kenya. Just be with them as they uh, are faithful servants of yours. And we are mindful of so many missionaries, Father, who have sacrificed their lives to proclaim the word in uh, lands uh, that are far from here, and some even at home. Sometimes the hardest field is at home. And we thank you for all of them who have uh, sacrificed so much to see that Christ is proclaimed in different ways. Uh, give them courage and strength in the season when we are enjoying family fellowship and they are still alone fighting the battle with the devil. Bless them, strengthen their families, be with their children uh, as they often have to go away from home for schooling and they only see their parents on occasion. They have definitely given up much to serve you. Bless them, we pray. Thank you for our church, for everyone who is here, for everyone who blesses and encourage us in our walk with you, who are part of our spiritual growth, the family of God, this blessed place we call our church. Thank you for the greater work. We think of so many churches in this community who are uh, proclaiming the name of Christ today, and uh, we acknowledge this morning that certainly we don't have a corner of the market, and we are grateful for every church where Christ is proclaimed. Bless them, we pray. And Father, as we now turn our hearts to the Word of God, just pray that our minds would be receptive to hear from you and our hearts would be willing to be shaped a little more into your image. Bless the words that are about to be spoken, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, at this time I'm going to call upon Gary to come and read the scripture. If you want to open your Bibles, if you have it, or you can follow along up here to Matthew chapter 1. 
verses 18 to 25.
And as I prepared this week, sometimes when you, we prepare, we find things we aren't expecting. And uh, I learned some things today that kind of really, or this week, that kind of really blowed me away about Joseph. Now, we don't talk much about Joseph in the Christmas story. We talk about the Blessed Mary, we talk about the angels, we talk about the Christ child, and so forth. But Joseph seems to always get ignored. But you know what I learned this week? We can learn a lot about Joseph, even though we know so little about him at the same time. And we can learn especially the faith that Joseph had and the obedience that Joseph walked in unto the Lord. Anybody who's had a child knows that there is great anticipation for the arrival of that new baby and an ex exciting time in the life of a home. Now, if you have five or six or seven kids, I don't know how exciting it is, but if you have one or two, uh, it's pretty exciting anyways. But for Joseph, in our story today, this was not good news. You know, I'm going to tell you something, and I say it many times, and I know I'll say it uh, in the future as well. Sometimes we know the story so well that we look past what's right in front of our faces. For Joseph, it was a very hurtful time. For Joseph, it was a difficult time. For Joseph, he thought that Mary had slept around on him. For Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant and he wasn't the father. His heart was totally broken. The woman he loved had cheated on him. And I am certain in a church that this, this size that there has to be a one, at least one person who understands intimately the pain of a loved one cheating on them. And in our story today, Joseph was called to have faith in God in the midst of excruciating pain. And so I ask you a question today. Can we have faith in the midst of difficulty. Does God reach out to us when life seems unbearable? And I think all of us who have walked with the Lord for any length of time all know the answer to that, of course, is yes. Have you ever paused on verses 18 and 19 of our text today? Let me read it for you again, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Now what do you notice in this text? Well, the first thing I noticed was the whole engagement thing. How can he be betrothed and then have to give her a letter of divorce? I couldn't understand that. I don't know about you. So I uh, did a little asking, what does that mean? So I learned three things this week as I studied into the, uh, the marriage thing in, in the times of Christ. First off, both families had to agree to the marriage. Now here in the West, that's not always the case. Sometimes we uh, have a, a, a fiancé who our parents aren't too crazy about, but we do our own thing anyways when we're young especially. Second, a public announcement had to be made in regards to their engagement. Now we do a similar thing of making announcement about uh, engagement in the paper and bulletins in the church and so forth, but there's a big difference between their announcement and our announcements. And this is so critical to understanding the, the, uh, the story of Joseph and Mary. In their culture, the only way to break off the, enga the engagement or the announcement of their engagement is by death or divorce. Quite different from us. And at this stage, sexual relations were not permitted and thus Joseph knew that he didn't have any relations with Mary uh, in, in this second stage of their marriage. 
And finally, in the last stage, the couple actually came together and married and began living together. So it is in this context that Joseph makes this heart-wrenching decision. He had to divorce Mary. She cheated on him. I could never understand the story until I understand or understood the marriage situation in the ancient Near East. Now you all know as well. And I think our text speaks volumes to the character of Moses. Sometimes we forget the stories in the Bible are about real people who have real problems, who have real emotions, just like we do. And knowing the stories as well as we know them, we often look past the bad stuff and get right to the end, because we know the end. And God doesn't want us to do that. Knowing the stories as well as we do, we forget what's in front of our face. So what do you think went through Joseph's mind in our story today? I think one of the first males that pierced his heart was probably in verse 18 when the child was referred to as his mother. His is a possessive word. The child belonged to Mary and not to Joseph. That would break any man's heart. Now remember, Joseph finds this out before he had the dream that we know the end of the story to. But before he had the dream, can you imagine the pain in his heart? They were engaged, and it's clear that the child was not his, but it was his mother's. Unfortunately, there are pl plenty of stories similar to that in our culture today. People are not being faithful to their spouses, yet burning it with lust in their hearts, and for unholy relationships, children are being brought up in all kinds of households today and environments. And the family is the cornerstone to any strong nation. And I think our nation is uh, reaping the benefits of some of the sinful behaviors families are undertaking today. And so Joseph, I think you're getting the point, I believe, was deeply hurt. But we also learn Joseph was a righteous man in verse 19. Now why describe or why put in that one little word that he was a righteous man? Well, I believe it's an important little word in understanding Joseph and his heart. Joseph, in other words, was a holy man. Joseph lived his life to please God the very best that he could. And God was bringing together Two very simple people, they weren't rich, but very simple people, to fulfill a very unique role in this world, to be the earthly parents of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And much attention had been given to Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, but we all look past Joseph. Joseph was a godly man. And so Joseph looks at the story, he looks at his pregnant fiance, and he says, what can I do? And he considers his option. How often in our culture do we hear of people doing things to please themselves at the expense of doing what is right in the Lord? Joseph obviously had very strong feelings for Mary. He loved her deeply. And yet the word of God gives him the right to do two things. Two things he had a choice to do. First one, I want you to turn with me in the Bible, if you have one, to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. verses 23 and 24. This is one of the options that Joseph had. If there is a girl who is a virgin engaged to a man, and another man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city 
and you shall stone them to death. The girl, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he has violated his neighbor's wife. Thus, you shall purge the evil from among you. And don't close your Bibles yet. We're going to look at one more passage in a second. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a little bit on the radical side to me. Uh, I don't know if I could ever consider stoning anybody, never mind my fiancé. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will assure you I could never do such a thing. Now, in our culture, it has become more common to ignore scriptures and do what society says you should do. Because you know what? Scriptures are kind of antiquated. But Joseph was a righteous man. He was a holy man. He gave serious thought to this text. To him, the word of God was to be obeyed, even when we don't like it. And he had a second option. Now look to Deuteronomy 24, verses uh, uh, 1 to 4. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. And she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, and if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife, since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination to them before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin into the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Of course, we see in our text today that this is the option that uh, Joseph took. That too tells me a little bit about Joseph, of the choice he made. Joseph was a very caring man. You know, isn't it the case when we have been hurt so deeply that two things come to our mind, either fight or flight? Fight or flight. And Joseph chooses grace. We often want to get back at the person. Joseph chooses the root that would be least humiliating for Mary. He's thinking of her, not himself. I think Joseph shows great grace and great character. What better earthly father can you think of to raise the child of God? Joseph was obedient in his faith to, to the word of God even if he didn't like it. And I almost think it suggests that Joseph was a man of great self-discipline. It takes holy discipline to follow the word of God, especially when you don't particularly like what it is saying. I think Joseph agonized over his decision. In our text, in Matthew it says, but when he had considered this, I think Joseph thought long and hard about what he should do with his fiance. It was tough for him. He could have had Mary stoned to death or give her a certificate of divorce, and he chooses to quietly, secretly, didn't want to humiliate her, to give her a divorce. And in his pain, he was gracious to Mary. I think Joseph was a man to be followed and admired. What greater father can you think of to be the king, to be the father of the king of kings and lord of lords, other than the man who obeys the word of God? Now I want to shift the focus just a little bit here this morning and talk about God's grace to Joseph and his love and grace to us in difficult times. I want you to notice right off the bat that God reached out to Joseph. God reached out to Joseph through the angel in the dream. God takes the initial step 
to show his love to him. He has sent his son Jesus Christ as a God-man to come and take away the sins of the world. But notice also God sent Jesus to be much more than a savior. We learn in the Old Testament in particular, we see the verses he made him to be Christ to be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Jesus intended for us to live in this world, but not to live alone. Rather, with the help of Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. God is trying to reach into our lives today, asking you, will you have a little faith in my Son, the Savior of the world? Now, I'm sure you all know by now that in the uh, scriptures, when a name is given to a person, the name has meaning to the character of that person. And what does the simple name Jesus mean? Well, we know some of them that I just said a minute ago, but Jesus means Savior. Savior. And what does Savior mean? It means deliverer or preserver. I like that. Deliverer or preserver. One thing you learn about me over the years is that I believe that when we ex accepted Christ as our Savior, we are saved indeed. We are assured. We are guaranteed. And I have spoken to many people over the years who feel like they've lost their salvation at times, and yet I profoundly agree with them, disagree with them. Because when you feel that way, it's probably because you're walking away from the Lord or living a very lukewarm or cold life to the Lord, and that is part of the Spirit's uh, idea to get you back in with him to make you feel miserable inside. Anyway, that's all in sermon on another time. God offers the Savior to the world who will preserve you to the end. You also know God offers us hope. I love the fact that God intervened in Joseph's life. No doubt he was a broken man. And God showed his love to him by breaking into his troubled heart and giving him hope in the midst of the despair. And God is still here today. And he's knocking at our heart's door to bring hope to you in the midst of trials. His help comes from the Word of God. His help comes from brothers and sisters in the Lord, your family in the church. His help comes from your private prayer time with him. His help comes when you are still before the Lord. Notice Joseph gave careful consideration as to what he, did, he should do. And Joseph saw the two options that I just read for you in Scripture. And he said, I only have two choices. And God said, you know what, Joseph? You actually have a third one. And that third choice is to marry her. And one thing our text shows us is God gives comfort to Joseph. In the midst of being on the outside through this process of the pregnancy, of feeling cheated on, rejected by the woman he loved, God gave assurance to Joseph. You will be his earthly father, and you will have the privilege of giving him his name. Joseph, you are part of my plan. You have a purpose. You have a calling. You are the earthly father of my son. God desires to comfort your heart today. Pastor Robert was right last week when he said suicide is highest at the Christmas time, a time when we talk about love and peace and joy and happiness. It just goes to show us how so many people are hurting. God can comfort your hearts. God also brings his presence. Who is coming into this world on Christmas Day? Was it a mere man? No, it was Emmanuel. God with us. And he hasn't left us to this day. 
He has left His Spirit to abide in us. I want to close by drawing your attention very quickly to one more thing. What does faith mean at the end of the day? It means to act. It means to listen and obey. And what did Joseph do after the angel came and spoke with him? He does exactly as the angel instructed him. He obeyed and he marries Mary. Not only did he marry her, but he kept her pure until the birth of the Savior. So what does faith mean to you today? God is reaching out to you as he reached out to Joseph. And will you accept his offer of salvation? He already is the Savior of the world. But in faith, you need to ask him to be your Savior. Life could be difficult today for some. And so I encourage you to accept his comfort and love through the presence of the Spirit. Fellow by the name, it's an old, old book. Brother Lawrence wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. It's just a tiny book, but boy, it's a powerful little book. It is a classic book talking about learning to walk as if God was walking beside you every moment of every day. And you can live like that. It's not magical. With just a little faith. Have the faith of Joseph. When his plane believed God, as Abraham believed God and was accounted in his righteousness, as Moses believed God, as Paul believed God, and so many of the saints of the scripture believed God and acted in faith and obedience to the Lord. And you too can trust and believe God for your salvation this Christmas with just a little faith. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we are grateful for this story today and how it touches our lives so many years later. Thank you for the faith and obedience of Joseph. Thank you, Father, that you reach out to us, offering us the salvation of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray as a church, we would be mindful that we need to share this to this community, that this community can be a lighthouse beacon of hope and comfort and acceptance and love to people who hurt. Give us a passion for each person in this community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. In closing, I invite you to turn, if you'd like, in your hymnal to 172.
able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Christ Jesus our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority for all time, now and forevermore.